Thanks, Ray. It's really good to see you again. It looks like you've been doing a few things lately, uh, presentations online. That's really great. I'm so glad. Uh, so welcome, Matt. Let me do an introduction here. I met Cynthia the first day I was in Mexico at the hospital. Uh, Dr. Ingrid Estrada Bellman, who was a guest yesterday, took me to see her. And ever since then, I, uh, I mean, we've had gaps in communication, mainly because of my travels and all that, but we've stayed in touch. And then she so generously wrote a, uh, a chapter on nutrition for my book. Now, it's not in the English version of the book. It will be in the next edition that publishes in a few, two, three months from now. Um, but it is on the book support website. It's on there in English and it's on in Spanish. And it is in the Spanish version of the paperback book. So, um, I just want to, I want to welcome Cynthia Lopez. She's going to talk to us about Parkinson's and nutrition in Parkinson's disease. Thank you, my friend. And I'm going to share controls with you because you have a slideshow, right? Yes. Um, I think, I'm not sure. See what happens if you open your slideshow. Let's see if we see it. There it, there it goes. Can you see it? Yes. I do. Yes, yes you can. Everybody else see it? Yes. Yes. I have to disappear for one minute, but I'll be right back. But please, you start up. Start up, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there we go. Well, hello. I'm, well, like Carl, like Carl told you, I'm Cynthia Lopez. I'm a Parkinson nutritionist. Um, I've been working with, with this, this disease since I was starting my career, it's like already seven through eight years. So I'm kind of, I'm in the research thing. So we, we've done a lot of things here in Mexico and it is great that I can that I can show you all the stuff that we've, that we have found and that we have worked with all the patients here in Mexico and that we, we saw already that it, that it helped Parkinson's disease improve and, and that uh, our main focus is to improve quality of life of the patients. So it, uh, I, lo I love to teach about this, this topic because it proves, I have proof that it, it works really good in Parkinson's. So, First of all, I would like to, let me, there it goes. Uh, what is nutrition? Nutrition, uh, the first thing we think about nutrition or the first thing, well, here in Mexico, uh, when I go with a patient, the first thing they, they think when I when I tell them, hi, I'm a nutritionist, they, they always tell me, I don't want to be that in a diet. I don't want to stop eating that junk food. I don't want to stop eating the that sugar stuff so it's kind of difficult to teach people and to to let them know that nutrition is more than that so and uh, well nutrition is is it's a science that it all it does not only talks up talks about the diet and and to stop eating junk food be, be, because it's about all the nutrition it's about nutri distribution of, of nutrients and how they affect the metabolism of humans if we don't have a good distribution, we are we are going to present some excessive nutrients or some deficiencies. So this kind of stuff and this kind of inequality in the nutrients can affect uh, our body and, and a lot of things, not only our weight. Uh, well, an excessive and insufficient intake of these nutrients can be can be severe consequences to our body especially in Parkinson's disease. We have found in the park in Mexico patients that they don't eat enough fruits and vegetables and with that they don't eat enough vitamins and, and like 90% 90, 90 of patients have deficiency in iron. And that is a really worry worried thing because we can't we can't have the, the that deficiency and it is not only in iron it's a lot of uh, vitamins 
Therefore, nutrition is essential during all stages of life to maintain good health. So that is a, a, like a, the, the definition of nutrition. Well, the importance of nutrition in, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, many people don't know that it is very important and that we can and that, and that we we need to start seeing this this topic. So Parkinson's disease is associated with a lot of nutritional problems. One of the most important problems is the malnutrition caused by involuntary weight loss. This malnutrition caused by this weight loss is because of the involuntary movements. When we have involuntary movements that we can't control, we have a, a well, I'll explain that in the in the another slide. This the it's the the main focuses. Uh, we we began to lose our muscle mass and we have a lot of gastrointestinal problems. So this is why we we need the nutrition in Parkinson's disease so that we can stop these problems and and so that we can improve our quality of life and and don't don't let the disease advance more. Well, this is about the, the, what I was telling you about the nutrition, the weight of weight loss. Well, our nutritional stat, status, it's mainly focused in the food intake. We, we eat our food and that is called energy intake. That energy intake is what body needs to, to make its functions. So when we have involuntary movements, the food intake that comes from energy intake, it's shorter than the energy expenditure. The, en the energy expenditure is the, is the energy that we lose in all of our activities, in exercise, in our simple activities of our bodies, na natural activities. So it's like a relation, also, it's like an, a relationship between energy intake and energy expendi expenditure. So what happens in Parkinson's disease? Well, our energy intake, in most of cases, when, when we have a weight loss, the energy intake, it's, it's down, it's shorter than the energy, exp no, uh, sorry. The energy intake is higher than the energy expenditure. We began to lose a lot of energy expenditure. So we need to eat more food so because we need to, to make a balance between our energy intake and energy expenditure. So if we, if we see in our bodies that we began with a lot of weight loss and that we haven't had that weight loss in the past months, that, that is talking about that what I'm eating, it's not that sufficient, it's not the necessary food that my, that my body needs. So we need to, increase that energy intake so that energy expenditure does not goes down. Uh, I don't, well, if you have any questions, you can stop me, right? Um, this is one of the weight loss. This happens because of involuntary movements that comes with a malnutrition and a loss of muscle mass. In every symptoms of involuntary movements, it's like they go, it's like a chain. I, I, I wonder, I, I also explained that it is all like a chain. If we don't eat well, then we are going to have malnutrition. If we have malnutrition, there, then we're going to lose our muscle mass. And it's like all the, all the stuff is, it's, it has to be all right. Well, like we have to take care of all the things, not only one thing. So, that is one of the most important things in Parkinson's. Uh, there is another side. Not all patients have involuntary movements and not all patients have a loss of, of weight. And it is all another, another side that is that we have patients that had overweight and obesity because the, the food intake was very excessive. We had, we had a excessive food intake that lead them to overweight and obesity. And that also affects our body because those patients had more are the patients that they don't only had the Parkinson's disease they also had diabetes they also had hypertension so we are not going to only see the, the part of nutritional diet in Parkinson's disease but we have to take care also with diabetes and hypertension so it's like we are trying to to control a more kind of stuff here 
So the most frequent that happens in Parkinson's disease is the one that it's uh, that has muscle uh, weight loss and muscle mass. Well, uh, there's some kind of stuff that we we have to take care of in our diet. This this stuff that I that I will tell you it's like a more general scenario. It's the time doesn't go doesn't have we don't have enough time to present it more specific because but this is the the, the general stuff you need to know about the Parkinson's disease diet. Well, energy intake is like due, due to common symptoms that I, that, that it's tremor, rigidity, a greater number of, of calories per day is necessary. That, that is to prevent energy expenditure. That's what I was, I was telling you in the slide before. Uh, high calorie eating plans are recommended to counteract unintended weight loss. It, I want to mention that we can't give this kind of diet to all patients. No, the patients need to have their personalized plan. And this is very important because uh, it, is, it is kind of, many times most of the patients want to see, want to do the same kind of stuff like like their friends or their or their or their family and no we need to we need to make this very personalized and we have to make it uh, very individualized because not all the um, metabolisms or not all the bodies are the same and maybe your friend does have a weight loss, but you don't have a weight loss. And if, if you begin to eat a high calorie eating plan without having a weight, a weight loss, you were going to have an over, o, obesity or overweight, overweight, and then you can, you can have higher risk to present other diseases. So this is very important that you to know that all, all eating plans have to be personalized by your necessities. Another nutrients that we have to take care of is fats or lipids. There is one, one of the most important lipids that is omega-3. Uh, this is one, uh, I, I, it's, it's the best uh, fat in Parkinson's disease. There are several studies that have proved that a supplementation of this fat increases the dopamine levels in brains and, it, and reduces the neuroinflammation. So, if we know that we had, we have to have omega three, and we are not having a supplementation of this fat. Well, uh, there are a lot of foods, and there are a lot of, of things that has it by in the natural way. So the only things that, that that we have to do is eat them, and where we can find it is in tuna, in salmon, in soybean oil, in almonds, and walnuts, peanuts, all the kind of these seeds. About the protein and their interaction with Leuropa, um, this is one of the most important things that happens, but I, I also want to make a, a, a special uh, announcement here. Not all the patients have these interactions. Not all the patients have this sensibility of the protein interactions with the, the Leuropa. We know that Leuropa is one of the main uh, medications in Parkinson's disease. Not all patients consume levodopa. There are a lot of other, other medications, but also the patients that consume levodopa, not all the patients have this high sensibility between the protein interactions with the levodopa. What happens with this? Well, <clears throat> one of the, of the main consequences of this is like, if we consume levodopa and we feel that 30 minutes, 40 minutes after we consume it, the Leuropa is not making the, it's not, uh, uh, sorry for my English, I, I forgot some words in, in English, so. Not it, as effective. <laughs> it, 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 Mande? It's not as effective. Uh, yes, it's not as effective. So when we consume Leuropa, 30 to 40 minutes, if we see that that the effect, it's not like we want to, or that, or that the effect it it doesn't have any effect in, in our bodies. We there are a lot of patients that blame the levodopa, that, that that blame me that the levodopa isn't enough, that they have to need that they need uh, 
a higher increase of labor Europa and that in that is not necessary because because if we if we make a that's when Dr. Ingrid and Strada, the, the one that I, the neuro, neurologist with, with which one I worked, first, she doesn't increase level Europa. She first come to me, so uh, tells me, okay, this is happening. Level Europa is not making the effect that we want. Can you please uh, see if the protein is interacting there? So the first, the first step we need to do is see if the protein is interacting with the level Europa and it's and it's avoiding the absorption of the level Europa. So that, that's the first thing we have to do, make a redistribution in the protein intake so that we can see if really is a level Europa that is, that is in very low doses or, or that is the diet. So in most of the cases, it's diet. The, the patients are eating a lot of, pro, of animal proteins that don't that that are avoiding that the level Europa absorbs absorbs well. So we don't have to increase the level Europa. We only have to control proteins in diet. That is in most of the cases. But there are another cases that don't happen this. That it's that they don't have any uh, this sensibility and. Yes, they have to increase level Europa. So that's why we have to evaluate your 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 how your necessity, how your body is reacting to the diet, how your body is reacting to the the level Europa and all the medications. So this is one one thing that not all people knows, and that we have to be to begin to to start seeing or start paying attention that if it is. And to start paying attention to our bodies because our bodies always tell us when something is wrong. So if you see that Levo Europa, it's not the it's not very effective, then pay attention to diet. Pay attention to diet, make one, two days, one redistribution in, in proteins, and see if that helps you. If that helps you, then okay, there is an, an interaction between protein and Levo Europa. If no, there no interaction. Just what we need to do with this interaction? Well, the interactions are between animal origin protein and level Europa, only animal origin protein. So in those cases, what we need to do is consume vegetable origin protein during, during day, during all day, and only in the night, we are going to consume the animal origin protein. So breakfast, dinner, only, be, um, food that are vegetable origin protein. And when you are going to, to eat at the night, well, now you can eat your animal origin protein. That is the kind of diet that we give to these patients that have this high sensibility to the interactions between level Europa and protein. These have a nutritional objective, that is that both are properly absorbed by the body and thus prevent the, pro the progression of the disease. Well, several studies worldwide have created exper experiments with, this, with, with these different types of diet. One is that they had a low proportion of animal protein, the protein redistribution, and adjustment of food intake with medicine to avoid competition. What is this? Low, protein, low proportion of animal protein, I do not recommend it because, because in Parkinson's disease, we have a high we have a very high sensi sensitivity to lose weight. So if I restrict my animal protein, I will lose weight more, uh, more faster. So I do not recommend this kind of diet. What I recommend most and what, what, what had helped most in, in Mexican, Mexican patients is protein redistribution. Because I don't have to eliminate any kind of protein. No, the, the, the patients are consuming their protein that they need, that the body needs. I, I'm only do uh, what I'm only doing is redistribution, re redistributing in what in what hour you're going to consume this protein. So, can I ask a question here? Yes. What if you're trying to lose weight? Would well, it be okay to do the low proportion of animal protein then, if you're trying to lose weight? If you're trying to lose weight, you also have to take care of this because one of the things in I do not recommend this 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 proportion because 
well, you you said high proportion. Sorry, uh, low proportion. Like I, I, I'm trying to lose weight, so. Okay. Okay. Well. This kind of low proportion diet, uh, animal protein or any kind of protein is not really recommended because you're not going to lose fat. You're going to lose muscle. So in Parkinson's disease, I know that, that if, you, if, you, if you say to me, okay, I'm exercising. Okay, that's, that's good. You're, you, are, you are going to muscle. Yes. But muscle don't only don't the muscle needs also the protein and one of the most effective proteins in muscle is animal protein so in this kind of diet if you're going to lose weight i recommend a, a diet that has a low proportion of fats and carbohydrates not of animal protein because we need to we need to lose the excessive fat not we need to lose the the the, the muscle that i have so i don't recommend it I, uh, I recommend, I prefer a diet that is adjusted to fats and carbohydrates, not protein. Proteins, it's like uh, a nutrients that we have to, to take special care in this disease. So that I can, so because of, uh, so that I can't affect my, my muscle mass in the future. So that's the, the diet that I recommend in this kind of, of, of situations. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just going to just interject for one second. I have a couple of people I work with who have also severe dyskinesia. So, I mean, their involuntary movements are just all over. Um, and then when they take their cinemat or levodopa, they're calmed down some, but it's very, it's very, very sad. The ins inspirational part of it is that they're very committed to doing the best they can to stay strong and to keep moving. Uh, as safe as possible, but I, with these two people, they must be burning a lot of calories because on a day where it's not warm, let's say it's not hot outside, it's, it's, it's well, I don't know Celsius numbers well, but if you were to translate it to around maybe 65 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, in, in in this person's house, and actually in both of their houses, 65 to 68 degrees, and just sitting and moving, uh, just the dyskinesia itself, they'll have a, a, a t-shirt, they'll sweat through a t-shirt in minutes sometimes. They might go through a couple t-shirts in one hour without even working out, which just leads me to think that there's a high cal calorie burn going on and probably muscle mass is being lost, you know? Yes, yes, yes. And, it, and it, it is happening. Um, last, week, last week, I had a patient that he also had a very, their involuntary movements were very high. So I first started with a diet of two, around like 2,500 calories. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't enough. I had to, to oh. increase the calories more than that because the patient with that calories in two weeks he he lost he lost like five five kilograms i, I don't i don't from um around uh, like five kilograms in two weeks it's with a with a calorie intake of 2500 so that would be um 2.2 pounds per kilogram times five is 11 pounds that's a lot whoa that's a lot and, and he had already a high calorie intake diet. So more or less, you can see what kind of diet we need when the involuntary movements are very high. So we don't need diets of a 2000 calorie intake. No, that it's a very little calorie intake. We, we need diets with a minimum of 3000 calorie intake because that movements are all day long. They don't have a, 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 a moment that the movement, it's, it's like, it, it's like they don't have movement in a very short kind of day. No. Exactly, they're always moving, yeah. Yes. So this is very risky because if we don't pay attention to those patients and they begin to lose uh, uh, muscle mass, they are risk of, of this disease called sarcopenia. 
which is a muscle mass, a muscle malnutrition. And this sarcopenia is one of the most risky diseases that we can present. And, and, and in a lot of, of patients, it's, it's a, mal, a silent malnutrition. We don't see it. Yeah. We, 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 the, one, the, the only thing that we, well, not in all, in all patients. There are patients that it is very, um, I forget the word, but that we can see the sarcopenia. But in other patients, we can't see it, and it is very difficult to 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 take care about this. But with nutrition, with anthropometric measurements, and and a lot of measurements that I do to my patients, I can see what is happening with muscle mass, so that I can I uh, I can identify sarco uh, I uh, little muscle mass after before presenting sarcopenia because presenting sarcopenia it's one of the most difficult things sure. you have to really pay attention with this and it is very difficult to to i uh, i uh, also when we have well, sarcopenia yeah. we can rewind it it is right very okay i got it. yeah that makes sense yes, yes, yes. So, I, sorry i didn't mean to get you off track there go go ahead Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, Parkinson's disease affects all patients differently, like, like I'm telling you uh, before. Therefore, it is very important to evaluate the nutritional status of each pa patient because this is the only way we can determine the best diet according to their needs and according to what kind of exercise are you doing? How are your involuntary movements? You don't have involuntary movements. Uh, it is ha it ha this has to be very individualized. The, like I was telling, also not all patients have this high sensitivity to dietary proteins, but it is very important to be evaluated by, that, by a dietitian so that they can identify if there is this sensitivity and they can give you a plan before you have a problem, not, a, not when you have the problem. No, before. We have, we have to in Mexico, here in a way, we, Dr. Ingrid, it's like a must to go with nutrition, with, with a nutritionist, because she doesn't want that the patient go to a nutritionist when he, is at, he or she is at risk. No, she wants to have a preventive program. So this is kind of, of really good to patients because we, we can help the patients before and nutritional problems appear. Okay. Mm, well, like I was telling in my professional experience, uh, one of the most, uh, one of the diets that have worked really good with my patients is the one where we redistribute proteins during the day. Uh, I, I say it again, vegetable protein intake during daytime and animal protein intake during nighttime. Um, well, this I, I, I already told it. Well, well, we, where can we find ve uh, vegetable protein? It contains it in beans, lentils, broad beans, chickpeas, among others. Well, another recommendations to uh, to another ad alternative in diet is to balance the amount of protein according to the healthy weight. Well, one of the, the biggest questions that I received in, in, the, in my experience is what is the amount of protein that I have to consume to my body? Well, the amount of proteins that we have to consume is 1.5 to 5 grams of kilogram. But that, but that kilogram is not only of what, I'm, of what is my, my weight right now. No, of a healthy weight. I have to first identify what is my healthy weight. And okay, I know that my healthy weight is this, well, that I, I only do on multiplications to 1.5 to 5 grams. What kind of grams that we are going to consider? Well, that, that depends to the kind of, of activities that we are doing. Okay, if you are a person that does not do any kind of exer exercise, well, and you don't have any kind of involuntary movement, the, the amount you have to multiply your healthy weight is 1.5. If you're a 
a person that have a moderate activity uh, and you have uh, moderate involuntary movements, then you have to multiply it by three, 3.5. And if you are a person that had that have a very high involuntary movements, that, that is a very high activity, you're going to multiply it by five. And that's more or less the, 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 the amount of protein you need to take during your day. Um, well, another kind of uh, another stuff here is that the amount rich is divided into the main meal times in equal amounts. But considering that Levoropa should be consumed 30 minutes to one hour before each meal. This to prevent any kind of interaction of levoropine protein. If you are, are, high, are having a high sensitivity to these interactions, then you're going to eat animal protein in the night, like I told you before. Here. Well, this is about vitamins. I, I really love to talk about this this topic vitamins intake because uh, in most most of the cases we focus a lot of a lot uh, in proteins and we forgot that we forget that we have also vitamins and and minerals that helps our, our body to regulate a lot of a lot of our systems and here i try to put one of the vitamins to show you one of the, the most important vitamins in this disease, uh, like vitamin B3. What does this vitamin do, do to our bodies? They remove all toxic chemicals from the body. And we can find these vitamins in coffee, in meat, eggs, wheat, tomatoes. You're going to see that the, the, the foods that contain this, the, these vitamins are very similar. Uh, for example, salmon, it doesn't only contains vitamin D, it also contains uh, a vitamin B C and some kind of omegas. So you're going to see that, that the foods are very similar to each other. Another vitamin that I also recommend and that uh, uh, like I want to know that in my in my diets, in, in all of the all of the diets that I give to my patients, they are considering these kind of vitamins, these kind of minerals. So they're regularly consuming this so that they can prevent some deficiencies and, and we really see good good effects in the patient. So you all you are going to to feel different when you when you begin to consume this kind of diets. And also vitamin B C B6 sorry uh, this helps regulate mood and it is, it is containing salmon, tuna, whole grains, legumes, broccoli, peppers. Vitamin C. Well, this vitamin C protects a lot of uh, Parkinson's disease patients from levoropa toxicity. And not all patients know that, know this. So it is very important that you regularly consume this vitamin C. We can find it in, a, in all the citrics, but if you live in a region that the citrics are not very good, well, you can find it in a supplementation. So it's, it's a vitamin that we, we can find it easily to consume. So I, I recommend a lot that don't forget this vitamin. Uh, also vitamin E, uh, this vitamin pre uh, helps prevent the occurrence of the disease and we can consume it in olive oil, aspar asparagus and mango. And also vitamin D that this protects dopaminergic nerves from toxicity, neurotoxicity. This vitamin, a lot of neurologists supplement this vitamin in since beginning of the, of the, since the beginning, because they know that vitamin D it's like a must in this, in this disease. And there are some also there, the, we, we can find it in some foods like salmon, sardines, and the best, when we can find vitamin D is taking like 10 to 15 minutes in the sun. We have to take sun a little. And of course, we, ah. I have a question, Cynthia. Yes. Uh, what about coffee? Because for example, when I take coffee, it just puts me a little more, I mean, like stressed out and I have tremors when I usually don't have. What happens with coffee? Coffee, coffee. Sorry, one of the effects in coffee it's precisely that it increases the 
Adre adrenaline. 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 Yes. It increases the, this in the body. That's why most of the people consume coffee. There are a lot of studies in Parkinson's disease about coffee. And include in not all patients, but in a lot of patients, they, they see it like uh, good stuff. That, like there is good that you consume it because that what makes coffee in your brain, it's like they're increment they're they're increasing all the neurotransmitters in brain, so that will that will help you. So, but not in all patients. I know you, Laura, and I know that you have a, a lifestyle very actively. You you don't need an excessive of neurotransmitters because you have because your health your healthy lifestyle already is giving you that 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 the, it, it is already giving you the deficiency that it is seen in your body. For example, you do a lot of exercise and exercise helps you to increase the amount of neurotransmitter in your body. If you big, uh, uh, consume also coffee, that will be double increasing your neurotransmitters. That's, and that's why I am why so. Uh -huh. That's why you are you are uh, seeing or you are seeing that that like hyperactivity. Uh, yes. So we have to take special special care in that. If you are having a healthy lifestyle that is helping you to prevent that deficiency in neurotransmitter, you don't need coffee. Because, but what is yes. Sometimes I just would like a cup of coffee, but if I take it, it just just won't work for me. I, I don't take one cup of coffee because I'm so active. I think I'm hyper hyperactive. But Laura, <laughs> but, but Cynthia, can she have one cup? One well, cup? Would, or decaf? Can I have decaf? Yeah. decaf. decaf I'm a coffee, coffee person here, so I understand. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Me too. Because I, 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 haven't, I haven't had one for years. So I just want one. <laughs> well, in that case, uh, one of the things that I recommend is don't take the cup of coffee like, okay, I haven't had it in years. I will see if, if, if that affects me. No, don't, don't go to, a, to one cup, go to half, a, half of a cup. Because if you don't go to one cup, it's too much. You, we, first, we want to know how the body reacts yeah. to coffee. So take a little bit. If you know that if you have, okay, I, I took a one a half of a cup and my body seems well, I don't, I don't see any kind of, of reaction of rare symptom. Okay, take your cup of coffee, but don't take it daily because that won't be good to your body. Or when, um, in that cases, when we are very susceptible or we, when we are very sensitive, sensible in, with one kind of, of food or one kind of, of, of meal or any kind of, of sub, substance, we have to, to take a little bit to know if what is telling your body about that, of that food. Okay. okay. Like I, you. If, you, if you tell that half cup, no. It, oh, it, I mean, it's 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 more, more milk or more water than coffee. Can I try yes, that? Yes, exactly. Or decaf version. I'll try that. Thank you, Cynthia. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, another, well, mineral intake, one of the most important minerals is iron and magnesium. Uh, iron is, a, is high consumption related with Parkinson's disease. And we can find it in nuts, whole grains, and legumes. This iron, it is very, most of the studies, a lot of the studies, they found high consumption of iron in patients. But rarely in Mexican patients, we don't have a high consumption related. I, uh, the, most of the patients that we attend is patients that don't have a very high access to food. So this is kind of difficult when we are trying to, to make an intervention in nutritional diet because we, we need to, to give foods that they can have the access but can help them also. So this is kind of difficult but that yes, we need to do to, to help these patients. And another mineral is magnesium. This helps protect neurons and muscles. So especially muscles because 
I want to make a really special emphasis in magnesium because Parkinson's disease already affects muscle. And, and if you're having some kind of, of reaction to your muscle or pain in your muscle, you really need to, to go and look if you have to, if, if you have to consume magnesium because some kind some because in an, in a lot of cases you are going to see that maybe that you are not consuming any kind of magnesium so you have to protect your body we can find it in nuts tuna green vegetables like spinach <clears throat> broccoli and other kind of uh, peppers and and those kind of green vegetables well uh, talking about gastrointestinal problems, one of the first problems that is happening in Parkinson's disease is constipation. So what can I do to prevent constipation? When you already have constipation, it is very important that you need a special diet, a specialized diet to, to remove that constipation. Yes, diet helps you remove. I've seen it in my patients, uh, but it takes time. You're not, uh, I, I always tell to my patients, we're going to remove constipation in a natural way. And since it's a natural way, we are going to take some time. So you have, you have to be very patient in this kind of diets, but yes, it helps you because I've seen it in my patients, but there, if you are a patient that, okay, I'm not that constipated, I, uh, you're going to take care of to prevent this constipation because it's very common in Parkinson's disease. One of the, of the first thing is modifying your lifestyle. There are several things that we have to modify. And here I, I, I try to show, the, show you in this, in this image that there are 10 things that are very important to prevent. And one of those, those that I know that you, most of you do it is exercise. Also consume a lot of water. Uh, here in Mexico, I have a lot of problem with my patients that they don't like to consume water. Uh, I'm uh, always, I'm telling, I, I'm, telling they, I'm telling that they have to consume water, but they don't like water. They, they, they don't like that it is, that they, it is tasteless. So I have to, to see where, how they can consume it that they like. So this is a very important thing. Also probiotics, I like to talk about, I, I love probiotics because some, some persons don't, don't really see the importance of probiotics in gastrointestinal inclusive. Inclusively, we, there are a lot of studies that have already uh, identified that microbiota is related with Parkinson's disease. What it means is that uh, very poor microbiota, you are going to let the Parkinson's disease advance more. So we have to take care of, my, of our microbiota. So how are we are going to take care with probiotics? The kind of probiotic of the kind of bacteria that I need to take, it's, the, it's also personalized. It's, it's, if you don't have any problem of constipation, well, you're going to take some general probiotics. If you have uh, uh, specifically one problems you want you need to take another kind of probiotic so this is this these probiotics one of the one of the ones that I recommend a lot of Mexic in Mexico that are really helping my patients is one called Sinuverase uh, I don't know if you can find it in in other countries but in Mexico that it's one of the most important probiotics that I, that is helping my patients and not only with constipation they're helping it with diarrhea, we, we, um, gastritis or, or acids. So I want to take special emphasis in these probiotics. Also sleep well. Many of the patients have problems in sleeping and this is also related with Parkinson's disease because we are not, because of the deficiency in the production of neurotransmitters. So if you see that you have sleep problems, you have to do things. For example, there take, take a, lot of, a lot of lavender. Lavender helps you a lot to maintain your sleep. Teas, in, teas of lavender, um, oils, 
healthy oils to the diffusers and all of all of that things helps you to prevent the, the to have problems in sleep so if you don't sleep well you're going to eat more and and the food that is going to to that that the kind of food that you're going to eat more is junk food it is not healthy food so you have to take care in sleep also no stress this is very difficult in patients the most of most of the patients had stress because of the disease by itself. So try to do things that prevents your stress. Also healthy weight, maintain a healthy weight, eat enough, eat enough fruits, eat, eat your veggies. Goodbye to refined sugar. This is one of the most difficult things. And yeah. limit yeah. <laughs> toxic habits. Yeah. That those things is your I I I think it is the most difficult, but you are going to see a very good improvement if you eliminate it from your diet. So it's very important you take special care. Can I just mention? Can I just mention yes. something? Um, so I've I've dealt with uh, eating emotionally a lot throughout my adult life, probably since I was about thirty years old. So one of the things that I've found is, especially this time around. Um, you know, I'm one of those people that it took a, a life-threatening, almost, you know, being on my deathbed last year in Singapore with massive, massive amount of blood clotting to really make me uh, change my behaviors, perspectives, and what I appreciate in life, what, what's valuable to me in life. You know, family is definitely first. It always has been, but it's more than anything now. But uh, the reason I'm saying that is because I would ingest too much alcohol. I would eat too much refined sugar. And uh, once I finally got away from it for long enough, I seldom have the desire anymore. Now, have you found this to be the case with anybody? Because like I used to every single night, no matter what, I had a two or maybe three Oreo cookies because not, not, not that it's a lot of cookies, but I had to have those cookies. Like I just wanted to have them when I was binging on Netflix for a couple hours with my wife, you know, I haven't, the longer I get away from it, the less I, I don't even really think about it anymore. Is that something that happens to us? Is that, is it normal to have like a new behavioral pattern where you don't focus in on, or obsess on wanting like alcohol or cookies? <laughs> yes, it happens. Yeah. But one of the most difficult things is when you're beginning to change this habit. Oh yeah. This is, the, that time is one of the most difficult. And, and it's like the first, the like one to two weeks when you start to say no to this, to these habits, those weeks, those two first weeks are awful, are the, or, the worst. Oh, well, I remember but, that. Actually, it took me a few weeks, but it was really yeah. hard. Every day was so hard. Yes, yeah. You you are like desin desintoxicating your body. And when the body finally has eliminated all these habits, there you 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 start to, to notice that you don't want these these foods because your body already eliminated from your body, eliminated from your blood, the the, the sugar from the blood, and, and you began to just to to not wanting these these foods. But the, it is very well known that the first weeks are the most are the worst in this. Okay. But, when, but when you pass those weeks, you are not going to return to see that 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 foods because well, that's good because like you know these days i don't even think about when i'm done i don't mean to get you off track but I'm, I'm sure there are other people who are going to watch this who there must be at least one other person who deals with this too or has dealt with it i'm sure you know i hope not but i'm sure it is because we're humans right so now when i drive home or i drive around I don't have the urge to pull in the parking lot uh, and buy a, a bottle of vodka or stop and get some beer uh, or get Doritos or get chips or get Oreo cookies. 
or Reese's peanut butter cups, even better, even better, <laughs> twice as many calories. I know I researched, but I don't have that desire anymore. And I'm so happy now. I'm so happy that I can just bypass those. In fact, usually I'm past the stores before I even realize I passed them because I'm not thinking and I'm, and I'm obsessing about it. So I think um, for me, it's been really helpful. I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do in their life or how they should live or what they should eat, but I love number eight and nine on this slide. Uh, if you can get past this, if you can get past this, not ingesting these things, it's a different deal on the other side of it when you're finally past it, yeah. And your body, it's like you you feel it in your body when you eliminate this this kind of food, and especially is it's that's why it's also called like this kind of toxic habits. They are called toxic for a reason, and they are yeah. called like an, they, because they have an addiction into our to our body. So it's like the <clears throat> here in Mexico, it's like a theme that in some. French fries of sabritas, they they tell you that you can eat only one, like telling you that you need more. And that's because of the all the chemicals they have. The the food has a lot of chemicals that make your body addict to that to that food. Yes. And that happens not only to French fries, but all kind of junk, junk oh, yeah. food. They're, they have these ingredients that really makes an addictive behavior to your body and that really makes you you need that 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 food so that's why the first weeks when you're trying to remove this this addictive this uh, this toxic habit they're really really hard because you are like trying to remove this substance that yeah is trying you it's it's giving you that 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 addiction Well, it's, it's really interesting. So I'll just, just one more thing and then you can um, mm -hmm. move on. But back in 2013 or 14, maybe, I, might, I just, I don't know why I remember. It was in February of that year, whatever year it was. The New York Times posted a really cool article about Doritos and how Doritos uh, had to do with food science as well. So, and I was a nutrition student at Syracuse University at that point, right? So going through their program and all that. Um, It's actually not a very good program. That's why I need to hire you. So, but the thing is, it's in, in this article, it talked about how when you, well, I can tell you firsthand experience. If I open a bag of Doritos and I eat one Dorito, you can't eat just one. The commercials that Jay Leno used to do 20 years ago, but you can't eat just one. And then you eat the whole bag. You have to eat all of them because They're designed, they're chemically engineered, scientifically, scientifically engineered to, I think that they say that they interrupt the leptin hormone so that your brain doesn't get the message that you're full and you keep eating. And there's a lot of products like that out there. That's hundreds and thousands of them. But, but my, that's the example I like to use because anyone who likes Doritos, I bet you anything, you can't eat just one unless there's a lot of money on the line. <laughs> yeah it's chemicals yes it's very sad that most of the products have those chemicals but it's what's happening so so one of the things that we can do or we can make in our in our <clears throat> like in my YouTube, like uh in my profession it's like telling you what is happening so that you are informed about this kind of of ingredients or these kind of products and that most of the ingredients that they have it they aren't good for our bodies you're going to what what it is going to happen is that in five ten fifteen years you are going to alter your body and you're going to 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 have a new disease because of these of these products so it is like a very worrying thing but it is what happening in in this in this industry of of all kind of products of young food and all kind of those those foods yeah that right with the sugars then like we say people with parkinson's are parkinson's or people with parkinson's are people too i mean they're humans right the humans who live with pd but you can be a diabetic i have a diabetic a person with parkinson's who's diabetic um and it's brought on by probably all the sugar he ate in his life you know 
Um, he's a pretty big guy. Uh, I suspect another person I just started working with, or I'm going to start working with, is probably diabetic as well. And that sugar, well, actually, then statistically, according to what I know, and you can probably elaborate on this, people with Parkinson's are the, the latest thing I saw, but this is like two years ago, like 40% more likely to develop. Oh, I'm sorry. Person with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is more likely to end up uh, maybe living with Parkinson's because of the complications and the pathways. So all the more reason to eat healthy and get that crap out of your gut so it doesn't get inflamed and then you get a, some kind of movement disorder, right? Sugar, refined sugar is not really good to our bodies. And most of Mexican patients, I like, I like to tell you like, 80% of my patients have diabetes and Parkinson's disease. So it is a very worrying thing, yeah. but that we need to prevent it, to prevent that, that in, in, future, in future things. What, what percentage did you say? <laughs> Most like regards 80%. 80%. Whoa, that's a lot twice, of a lot of. That's twice as much as the thing I saw a while back, but I haven't researched that either. So thank you. That's good to know. Wow. Okay. It's because of our, our, our culture. Most of the patients here in Mexico don't eat fruits and vegetables. They only eat uh, very fat kind of foods and very fat uh, and sugar. They love the the sugar bread, like pan dulce here, he tell it. And we have a very good sugar bread. That's why oh, it know. is so addictive. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to take special care in this. You, you uh, and I am telling that you don't need to eliminate it at all. No, you can take one, but not daily, not, not all weeks and not every hour. No, you can take it, but in a very... <clears throat> preventive way yeah okay I'm, I'm sorry i don't mean to hold up progress but uh i just wanted to interject so thank you well finally it's a um uh, my conclusion even though is it has not been proven that nutrition cures the disease and we don't have a cure from to this disease Yes, we can help prevent other symptoms related with this disease, such as gastrointestinal problems, stop the weight loss, stop the muscle mass loss. So it is very important to have a transdisciplinary approach to improve quality of life in Parkinson's disease. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good. Okay, great. You got your con. I'll leave this contact up here for a minute. Um, really, really appreciate you sharing your your knowledge and, and, and your time. And I, you started late because of me. I'm sorry. Uh, well, let's, let's do this. I'm going to leave it like this for a minute. Um, although, wait a minute, everyone, everyone's going to get a recording of this. So I'll tell you what, let's, let's. Uh, I stop the share. Yeah, let's stop the share and just bring you back on the screen. And does anybody have any questions for Cynthia? Any questions at all? I have a question for Cynthia. Yep. What about alcohol intake? And what about if I, I want to take like a beer or uh, maybe some other kind of alcohol? I have Parkinson's, you know? Yes. What, what about okay. that? Can okay. I take one? Can, what kind? Should I take what? What kind shouldn't I take? I mean, I'm not. Okay. A, I'm not like as a, a social drinker or nothing like that. But sometimes, would you just want to take some one? <laughs> yes, one you can. And there are here in Mexico. You you are of Mexico, right? Yeah. Here in Mexico, we have. Uh, I don't know in other countries that if you can find those kind of low low calorie. Uh, oh, beers. beers. Here in Mexico, we have um, Ultra. The name okay. is uh, Ultra. Mm -hmm. It's a, a very low calorie uh, beer that you can have it. Yes, you can. One, you can have it. Two, I don't recommend it. <laughs> Especially because you are a very hyperactive person. So take care of this. And wine? I, 
One you can. I prefer that you consume wine because wine also have antioxidants. It doesn't and it is, it is, I'm sorry. Yes. It doesn't uh, interfere with the acylic. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. So take care of that because oh, oh, any maybe white wine. Yes, maybe white wine. Uh, all kind of alcohol can make you some because what the effect of alcohol in our bodies is that they they make our metabolism lower. So when we have a low metabolism, the absorption of all kind of medication and all kinds it is it is not good. So. That is one of the consequences of consuming alcohol by itself. Mm -hmm. Alcohol in all kinds of types, beer, wine, other alcohols. So we have to, to, to be very like, Cash. we have to know the consequences of consuming alcohol. But when you are tell that when, but when you are like, okay, one, I want to consume one or one. Like a cup of coffee. Yes, like a cup of coffee. <laughs> and and pre even uh, prevent those kind of for example if red wine is it's like red having wine. an interactions with a uh, with a select then consume another kind White of wine or another kind of okay thank you cynthia yeah. there's the time okay yeah sorry about my dog barking so um well that <laughs> That would explain why I lost about eight pounds within two weeks, three weeks of not drinking any alcohol. I mean, you know, here's the thing. I knew this already. What I went through, this is a sign of a person who probably was a true, uh, truly addicted or something, is, is that I, I would make excuses. You know, when you can't out exercise a bad diet. Well, maybe you can. I don't think you can. I don't know if you can. And you can't, you, you, you know, just at a point in my life where uh, I really want to be healthy and stay healthy and I have a granddaughter now. So I mean, like, you know, I've got a lot to live for. So for me, it's been a really good experience to be on the other side of, uh, you know, really starting to make some progress with, uh, well, I'm just going to let somebody in here who's going to listen and making progress in, in these areas. Um, so, I, you know, I appreciate all that you have uh, shared. Um, any questions from anybody else for Cynthia? This is such great information, especially when we think about how people can can be affected by Parkinson's. And, and when we look at the uh, medication and the complications that occur, can occur from eating your animal protein, let's say, for example, at the wrong time or the less than optimal time, so it interrupts the absorption of medications and decreases the effectiveness, then, you know, this is really important, relevant information. And I appreciate you sharing again. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Um, so, Cynthia, thank you very, very much. Um, I'll be in touch with you soon. Um, Laura is my official distributor of oh. my book. <laughs> so Mexico. This where you know I sent three books to Mexico two months ago, and none of them have gotten there. So we have a because she's able to get to the states uh, address there, or somebody's able to and get them back to her in Mexico. We have a, an arrangement, and you'll get a, a book soon. And it'll have your chapter in it because it's in Espanol. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. All right. Thanks so much, Cynthia. Take care. I'll be in touch soon. Bye, Cynthia. Bye. All right.